Hi. Uh, I'm the Low Runner, and I'd just like to say that I've always known in my mind that Emissary was the best of the premier episodes of Star Trek, but I don't think I ever really cogitated exactly how good it was until I went back through with analysis mode on. Going through this episode was a treat. I, I, I legitimately enjoyed it. I was like, ah, oh. I mean, Encounter at Farpoint was certainly better than I remembered, but this was just good. Now, there were issues, of course. A lot of uh, early edition weirdness was going on, and you could tell that they kind of were working in a different direction in some cases, Bashir being the obvious case. But I still found myself absolutely drinking in the scenes and really digging it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I just want to share one thing from a personal perspective. As you guys probably know, I have these big old notepads, big old ones, you know, 700 pagers, college ruled, you know, straight from, uh, you know, college uh, bookstores and whatnot. And uh, by total coincidence, this actually is the very first page. You, know, you can see the back right here. This is the back cover. So the DS9 emissary stuff, we could just start with a brand new notebook because the last page of my previous notebook was taken up by the last outpost in TNG and I did the TNG stuff before I did the DS9 stuff, you know, the stuff that you'll be seeing over the next couple of weeks. So I just thought that was amusing. You know, a whole, whole new sheet of paper because let's be blunt, that really is Deep Space Nine in a nutshell. So one of the, where do I start? One of the things that I find fascinating is going back and seeing Rick Berman talk about this show. Now, I'm going to give my opinion, and I have nothing to corroborate this other than the bits and pieces of Rick Berman's professional career that I know about, okay? I think Rick Berman kind of, when asked about Deep Space Nine, because most of the interviews talking about the creation of Deep Space Nine are from after Deep Space Nine was already going or had already been a success. So a lot of this information comes after the fact. And I have this personal feeling that, like a good executive, he has gone back and said, oh yes, we really wanted to try new things and we really wanted to accomplish new things and we, 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 we. Because Rick Berman is one of the mainliners for Deep Space Nine. He may not have been one of the people directly involved in its production, uh, Voyager and Enterprise would both get that particular honor. But instead, he was one of the people who had his name right there at the front of the credits. So this was important to his career, right? And I, and I can get that, even though he's a disgusting human being who will talk in great length about how much I hate him later. But for the purposes of this, I can see why he would do that. But one of the things I find most interesting is that everyone involved tended to talk about Deep Space Nine as an opportunity to get outside of the Roddenberry box, including Rick Berman. Now, for those of you, on the off chance you don't know what I'm talking about, although I will be talking about it over in the TNG stuff on Mondays, of course, the Roddenberry box was a concept of, it was basically a set of rules. It was a box, creatively speaking, and you were not allowed to go outside this box. And there were a lot of rules about uh, conflict or how people interacted with each other, you know, all that fun stuff, right? So... You know, that was all a thing that was designed with the Roddenberry box in mind. And when they set out to make The Final Frontier, which is the original uh, t terminology for this show, which was actually originally going to be spent on, set on a planet, too, uh, the only reason they didn't do that is because they figured location shoots would just get exorbitantly expensive, and they're right. <laughs> for those of you who know where location shooting is actually pretty costly to do. Go figure. Anyways, so they figured, okay, for this new Final Frontier show, we'll cheat and we'll kind of bypass the Roddenberry box. We'll introduce Starfleet personnel who get along with each other and have no internecine conflict and are all adherent to the Roddenberry ideal, but, but they basically pulled it technically on the situation because the Roddenberry ideal only applied to Starfleet. So they could do whatever the hell they wanted with everyone else. Now, I know you can't see this. I know it's hard to see the, my scribbles on, on the piece of paper here, but I sat down and just for fun, I wrote down each main character of the show as they were introduced in the order they were introduced and then did a little bit of visual diagram of connecting the, the characters in, in the ways that they were being, the dynamic between the characters they're being established, you know, pre-existing conflicts, that kind of a thing. And it goes like this, like if you were to, like here's the list, it's like this, 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 this. 
it's it's a bit patterned when you really sit and think about it, but it's kind of brilliant in its simplicity because they introduce a character, then they introduce a supporting character, and then an unrelated character. Then they introduce a uh, an opposition character for the first character, a supporting character, an unrelating character, and then an opposition or excuse me, I, I'm I'm saying this wrong. Then then a uh, supporting character, and then an opposition character for two characters up, and then a supporting character, and then an opposition character for two characters up, and it repeats this pattern almost all the way down the list. It's actually quite brilliant the way they've done this. The only real exceptions to this are Ducat pretty much the last main character introduced, and Morn, who I only wrote down for fun, although Morn was in this episode, so hey. <laughs> but it's, it, I love the way they've done that. And of course, this was all deliberate. They wanted to get outside of the Roddenberry box and do something. Deep Space Nine really... I, I mean, I talked about TNG and how character-driven and character-focused it is, but Deep Space Nine, when they started, they did so with the deliberate intent of saying, let's make a character-driven show. And I think a lot of that was being driven by TNG, which had become a character-driven show. And as such, they'd seen that it could work. And it was stated early on, I, I've already talked in the, in the intro video last week about all of the benefits of having a stationary show. One of the additional benefits is you can have a larger cast. Now this is interesting because this has been a problem since the original series and has been a problem that I, I only talked about very briefly over on Voyager. I constantly talked about guest stars. You remember that? I kept bringing up the concept of guest stars and the difference between a really bad guest star and a great guest star, you know, the kind that just, just explodes with energy and you really want to see more of them. Well, you can't because that character was there for that episode and you're on a ship. You're not going back to that planet, are you? Now, there have been ways that, that, that the creators of Star Trek have gotten around the guest star problem. You know, Reginald Barkley is one of their more, more awesome successes, along with Q. Uh, you know, John Delancey is another excellent example of this. But the point is, the nature of a starship-generated show, a ship where, you know, you solve the problem and then you move on, doesn't lend itself towards a larger cast of recurring characters. I don't mean mainliners. You notice Garrick isn't in this episode. Just to, Or uh, Kai Wynn, for example. Two very major recurring characters are not introduced here. Because they're not main characters. They're setting characters. They are recurring characters. You can do that when the camera stays in one spot from week after week. You with me? We'll be talking about how they fumble this in the next several episodes. <laughs> we'll get there. But I just wanted to mention it here because at the, at the start you can see the brilliance of the approach. It truly was, let's take Star Trek and do something different with it. And honestly, this was only the second time they'd ever done this with Star Trek. Maybe the third, if you want to stretch it. You could argue that the motion picture was something different for Star Trek. I don't agree personally, because I personally think the motion picture was a long episode with good effects. Not bashing it, by the way. I like the motion picture. I like it a lot more, having gone through it through with analysis mode on. But I don't think it was something new. Star Trek II was something new. And Deep Space Nine was something new. But... I think it's finally time we address the elephant in the room. <sighs> Let's talk about Babylon 5. Now, anybody who's seen my show knows that I have done a rumination analysis on the entire series of Babylon 5, except in Crusade and some of the direct TV movies they did. So, and I've also stated more than once that it's my favorite show of all time. Although I'll admit that the top like three or four are so close to each other that it, it might as well be a tie. But it's up there. It's a great show, and I love it. There is absolutely no denying there are some similarities between Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5, and I'm not going to try to do that. But the longer time has gone on, the more time I've had to think about it, and the more evidence that's come to light, the more I think that the similarities between DS9 and Babylon 5 are superficial at best. I want to share something with you, if, if you'll forgive me. So, we do know for a fact that JMS went to, to the studios, which at the time was Warner Brothers and Paramount, because they were doing this joint thing, and said, hey, I've got this treatise, I've got this show I want to do, and he was rejected. And so he went off and ended up making Babylon 5 with 
you know, I don't even remember the name of the studio. It was some garbage studio that later TNT would end up rescuing, you know, Babylon 5 from that mess. But anyways, so that was the original intent. Now, we also know, and this is just to be as, you know, as honest as possible, uh, JMS has a great dislike of the general Hollywoodization of things. He himself has pontificated and practically preached about how much he tries to keep the Hollywoodization out of his stuff. And, you know, I'm with that. I, I understand his mentality, and I get that. But I mention that because despite being so acerbic towards that Hollywoodization mentality, he has for decades at this point, well, I, I guess we're only reaching now the point where it could be called decades, but, you know, for a really long time, almost two decades, he has been of the mentality of, yeah, there might have been something going on, but whatever. And that's about as far as that's gone. Given that, given his mentality, given his creative license, given the fact that he has, especially nowadays, a lot more backing behind him when it comes to finances or legal matters, if he had, if he decided to bring it to bear, and the fact that Paramount is not exactly in the strongest position ever, I mean, if he really wanted to go after them legally at several points in the last, say, eight years, he probably could have, but he hasn't. Now, maybe that's just because he's the bigger man. Maybe it's because he doesn't feel there's an actual case there. Maybe it's because he doesn't care. I don't know. But I do want to talk about one thing in particular. Now, let's talk about the obvious similarities. Okay, we got, you know, this Frontier post, and it's a space station, you know, v variety of characters, Earth Alliance, Federation, Parallels. Uh, there's a character named Ducat on both shows. That's, that's a little bit eyebrow-raising, I'll admit that one. But really, the more you analyze the two shows, the more the comparisons break down. And something came to light within the last, well, very recently. Um, and that was a report from someone stating that back when the Paramount Warner Brothers thing was happening, that they were going to have this whole mainliner show and that they pretty much straight up stole the ideas from the Babylon 5 treaties that was given to them and shoved it down the pipe onto the DS9 people. Now, the way this story has been told makes it clear that the actual people involved at the development level were unaware of this, and it was the executive level that was pushing this. Which is interesting that they slant it that way. Now, here's the thing. If you've watched just about anything of mine uh, in the last year and a half or two, when I've been trying really, really, really hard to, to try and give as much due diligence towards what I purport as possible, and I admit I didn't do that in my earlier years of the show, and I actually feel really embarrassed about misreporting certain facts or information. Point being, if you especially watched last week's thing about TNG or on DS9, you know that there's some of this stuff that we just don't know. We have conflicting information or misleading information or people disagreeing or whatever, right? That's a thing. That's a thing we kind of have to deal with. I mention this because usually what tends to lead me towards believing a fact or an interview has credence, or credence if you prefer, is that it has corroborating evidence supporting it. Now, I will be talking about this, you know, my past, but in your future with regards to TNG over the next couple of weeks. Because there's a lot of facts about early TNG that just, some of which are completely unsubstantiated and it's just one person saying something, but some of which two or three or four people all agree on. So I'm more likely to believe that one than I am the former. Still don't know the truth. Always have to add that asterisk there, but I'm still not certain of it. Now, why I bring this up is because this report of them flat out robbing, you know, plagiarizing, basically, or ripping off, if you prefer, a more common term, Babylon 5, is uncorroborated. No additional sources agree with this. No additional people or information stating, yeah, no, that totally happened, or I feel like something like that happened, or anything whatsoever. Keeping in mind a lot of those executives are still alive and could actually comment on this thing and have not done so. Make of that what you will. Maybe they're just trying to avoid a legal battle, but I like to take that with a massive grain of salt. Now, you want my opinion on it? I'll go ahead and give it bluntly right here. I think JMS went to Paramount and said, hey! And they were like, yeah, that's not going to work. And then the idea was still in the office, is probably being bantered around amongst the executives, and some other executives involved heard it, including Brandon Tartikoff. Or Tartikoff, excuse me. I said his name wrong. I was even practicing in my head before I said it. Brandon Tartikoff. And they were like, that's a cool idea. Why don't we do something like that for Star Trek? 
and then DS9 was born. I mean, I, I'm cutting out details, but my point is, I don't think, and I never have really, that any deliberate effort was made on any specific groups of people to rip off Babylon 5 to produce Deep Space Nine. My opinion, and you are of course feel free to disagree or partially agree or have other evidence or whatever at your will. That's, that's of course completely up to you and I, I understand that. Now, <clears throat> having addressed that, let's talk about uh, some names. We need to talk about Michael Piller, Ira Stephen Bear, Rick Berman, and Brandon Tartikoff. Now, all of these names are the people who made Deep Space Nine. Um, obviously, a lot of people, a few hundred people made Deep Space Nine, but these are the biggies, okay? Michael Piller was given the reins of TNG after Maurice Hurley left, and so he had a lot of sway and influence in the Paramount excuse me, in the Paramount Studios in general, and with the Star Trek staff in particular. He also had the blessing of Roddenberry on quite a few things. I mentioned that because that meant uh, Michael Piller had a bit of sway. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Rick Berman, of course, a lot of people tend to forget this, but Rick Berman was always a studio man. He was an executive. He was not a writer. <laughs> he would dabble at writing, but he was terrible at it. He was not a writer. He was not a director. He was a producer. He was a money person. He is, I, I use that term in my show often and in real life to describe people who make decisions when it comes to corporate politics. And it, it, there's a lot of people who are in the money people category. That's why I use that term rather than saying, so the CFOs and the CEOs and the admin, you know, I, I just say the money people. So Rick Berman was a money person, and he had been a money person before he ever touched on Star Trek. And he was introduced to Roddenberry. And by all accounts, and again, multiple accounts agree with this, Rick Berman and Roddenberry, whoop, <laughs> let's try that again. There we go. Just hit it off. Okay. So Rick Berman effectively had the reins of Star Trek as a television franchise when Roddenberry's health really started to nosedive and then when he passed away. Now, this is very relevant because they had actually already started the very, very beginning conceptual work on The Final Frontier before Roddenberry had actually died. But at no point were they able to really go to him and say, hey, we want to do this, we want to do it this way, etc. I mention this especially because many fans, at least in the past, have stated that this show was a betrayal of Roddenberry's Star Trek ideals and of Star Trek in general, and that it is not Star Trek. Now... As I stated, I think last week, it's been a little while since I recorded that, I, I, when I talk to people about Star Trek, DS9 almost always, near universally, filters to the top when it comes to popularity. But that's recently. That's within the last 10 years or so. Well after the show had finished its run, right? At the time, this may, this may sound weird now, but at the time, Deep Space Nine was not popular, and in fact suffered from poor ratings its entire run, and again, had cancellation problems nearly constantly. It was only because of the efforts of some of the studio execs, and I have to give him credit, Rick Berman, that kept the show on the air. Although Rick Berman was not the only one involved in that, because we also have to give credit to Brandon Tartikoff. Now, some of you may be like, who the hell's that guy? Like, I imagine most of you know who Michael Piller and Rick Berman are. But Brandon Tartikoff is a lesser-known name. He was an executive at Paramount. Not just a television executive, an executive in, in Paramount itself, and actually functioned as their CEO and president for some of its existence, including when Deep Space Nine was made. He was the one who had a tremendous experience with television as a business now, normally you'd think that's a bad thing, but in this case it was actually a really good thing, as weird as that sounds, because he looked at it, and rather than thinking, I want to think of how many cents I can squeeze out of this property, his perspective was, this is the reality of running television as a business. This is what we can do. This is what we want to do. And he set out a plan. He's the one who set the seven-year standard, which many other shows, including pretty much all of Star Trek, and except for Enterprise, would then follow. And, and again, this is kind of a universal thing. Now, if, real quick aside, if you're wondering about the seven-year standard, the point is, after a certain point, creative bankruptcy just starts to happen. Uh, it, it's, it's unavoidable. Unless you constantly bring in new writers and new actors, a show at a certain point in time just starts to run out of steam. 
it doesn't you know the energy isn't there for the actors anymore the the creative oomph isn't there for the writers the directors are having trouble doing something new or interesting with it and it stagnates so he established the seven year standard to basically cap it off say seven years that's it and that's going to be the end of that show he also said we need another star trek show this is why i mentioned my earlier theory because if you look at the books and the actual memos and all the information we do have from back in the day, back in the 90s when this was happening, there is no denying that Brandon Tartikoff is probably the single most powerful individual when it comes to the, uh, the people who made Deep Space Nine into a show. I mean, yeah, there were, pe there were people who were creative and inventive and put their effort into it and, and good acting and good directing and good writing, but none of that happens if a money person doesn't say, make this happen, because that's business. Brendan Tartikoff was the man who said, make this happen. He didn't just give it his blessing. It was an order. We need a second Star Trek show. And he was the one who was fully on board with the idea, let's do something different. We don't want a second ship show, okay? We've already got one of those. Remember, TNG was still live when this happened. I forget the exact episode that was supposed to be. It was supposed to be Chain of Command, of course. We all know that. Um, so forgive me for not remembering the exact uh, date that there's a, you know, I can look it up really quickly. I got it up on my second monitor right now. Uh, so this would have been... Ship in a Bottle? That's a weird thing. But yeah, okay, so apparently Ship in a Bottle w would actually come out a few weeks later, so I guess I'd have to go back to the previous year. But anyways, the point being that this was... TNG was still active, right? TNG was uh, just entering its sixth season. It was 11 episodes into its sixth season when Deep Space Nine went on the air. And they, they didn't want that kind of self-competition. And they didn't want to basically do too much of the same thing. Or, if I was to put it in another terms, they did what I should have done. And I should not have doubled up on the Babylon 5 stuff because it was just too much Babylon 5. I mean, whether it was good or not didn't matter at that point because I was doubling down on my program. I had good reasons for doing that, and I don't shy away from that, but what I probably should have done is just not, you know, taken longer to get through Babylon 5, and then, you know, done nothing for the Tuesday feature for a while. Because the point is, you don't want to stagnate, right? So Brandon Tartikoff and Rick Berman were the money people who really pushed for this. M Michael Piller was effectively the showrunner for quite some time, uh, right up until, it, well, okay, if you follow the arc of Deep Space Nine, you notice that Michael Piller just kind of slowly fades into the background, where Iris Stephen Bear slowly fades into the foreground. And Iris Stephen Blair slowly, slowly goes from being a writer to being a co-producer to being a side producer to being an executive producer and so forth and so on, until it got to the point where, officially, as of the episode The Die is Cast, yes, that episode... That's when Iris Stephen Bear was officially in charge of the show. Although, again, if you look back at it, you can tell when his influence really started to be felt. So these are the men who really crafted Deep Space Nine. Now, next thing I want to talk about is a couple of specific things. First of all, I want to talk about Terry Farrell. Now, I'll be discussing some unpleasant things regarding Terry Farrell much later uh, in season six actually so it's going to be a while till we get there but all i'm going to say right now is that terry farrell by her own admission was treated well by everyone involved except for rick freaking berman yes really and as i mentioned before i like corroborating evidence and there's a bunch of it so unfortunately it looks like rick berman was in fact not exactly the nicest person to work with when it came to, to uh, all I'm going to say is that both Will Wheaton and Terry Farrell both kind of had their careers messed with by Rick Berman as a result of basically what we nowadays refer to as executive meddling. You know, the, the classic example of executive meddling. And I'll get into those specific examples later because it'll come up in the TNG stuff and of course it will come up here in DS9. And that's why Terry Farrell ended up leaving. Now, I bring her up, though, not, not to bash her or even Rick Berman, although I do love bashing Rick Berman. I keep that pillow right over there, just in case I get to punch him. It's the highlight of my day. But I bring it up because they brought her in specifically because she was attractive. Now, I mean no offense to her whatsoever, but she's not the greatest actress in the world. I would say she is probably one of the weaker actors of the principal cast early on. Now... 
before you think I'm being unfair, I do want to say that she shores that up very quickly, and it's clear based on, again, the fact that she actually had a pretty good relationship with most of the cast and crew, that she was shored up, and she became a better actor as a result of her experience on the show. So that's awesome. What is not awesome is the fact that they deliberately cast someone attractive, and by them, I mean you know, the people in charge of making those decisions, while the writer's room was like, we really want to bring something new into DS9. Now, when I say new, I mean a new race. Now, I understand this personally. You know, you, you design races as, in, as, as a fictional creator, and every now and again you come up with a new one, and you're like, ah, oh, and you just you want to use that new one because it's new, right? The trill were pretty damn new for Star Trek and had been invented for TNG. So they really wanted to do something with the Trill and they really wanted to examine that and, and develop the, the, the social norms and, and the, the, the laws and the culture and the customs. Because one of the things they really wanted to do with DS9, even at the offset, was to flesh out the fabric of Star Trek. I've talked about this before. Really establish you know, the cultures and people and dynamic and depth. All these things that help really make a setting feel more tangible. So they wanted to do this with the Trill. And they bring in Terry Farrell, and they're like, why is she in that prosthetic? Well, because that's what the Trill read. Well, but she's too hot for that. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> Again, multiple corroborating reports on this one. By all accounts, and we actually have pictures that are available in, in one of my magazines and online, of Terry Farrell back when she was wearing the prosthesis and then when they switched over to starting to do the dots because they wanted her pretty face to be visible. So then they took the trill and basically threw every rule about the trill out the window. In fact, and I... I <laughs> I know it's kind of a running gag that Star Trek fans are nitpickers, but uh, if you were to sit down and make a list of all the features of the Trill as they were presented in TNG, and then look, you know, then pull up a list of all the features of the Trill as developed in Deep Space Nine, I don't think any of them actually agree with each other. Even the symbiote itself is different. I don't just mean in terms of effects. I mean in the way it works. Remember, over in TNG, the host, I think was the name of the episode, the symbiote was fully in control, a completely parasitic creature. In DS9, it is made far more clear that it is an actually symbiotic relationship, and the two merge and share and become, you know, effectively a new person. <laughs> I mean, why not just call it something else at that point? I, I, I know that sounds weird. <laughs> Next thing they had to do is they wanted to get Cole Meany on board. Now, I've, I've talked about this uh, yesterday, I think, by your perspective, and I will be talking about this more in the future. Forgive me, Cole Meany, O'Brien, is one of my favorite Star Trek characters, period. This has been true for many years, and this has only become more so as I've been going through the series. And he's awesome. And everyone on board, everyone at the cast and crew, thought he was awesome. And the general gist of it was, that man is wasted in a transporter room. We need to do something with him. Well, why don't we get him onto this new station? Get him involved in this. And he just kind of naturally slid into the engineer's slot there. And it works so well. Even in here, the first episode of Emissary, O'Brien does a fantastic job of having a, a door thing. Forgive me one moment. Sorry about that. It's the mail lady. She wanted to deliver a certified package, so I had to go up and sign for it. <laughs> Where was I? Cole Meany was, uh, he slid so naturally into the role of improvisational engineer, and would become among my favorite engineers, although I have to admit, if I had to pick one of the roles across all of Star Trek that's my favorite for characters, it'd probably be the engineer slot. I mean, come on. We got Scotty, Jordy, O'Brien, Taurus, and Tucker. I'm sorry, but I like all those characters, so what do you want from me? Anyways, next thing to talk about is, of course, the Bajorans. So, when they sat down and they said, we wanted this Final Frontier thing, as I mentioned, they were originally thinking planet-bound. For production and reality purposes, they decided to go with the station. Which planet, though? Where do they set this? Now, from the very beginning, there was the idea of the Old West. You know, the sheriff and his son go to this new Old West frontier town, right? 
That was from the from the get go. So it had to be someplace not normal. So it couldn't be like Earth or Vulcan or anything else. You know, uh, I guess cosmopolitan or or urban. It couldn't even be suburban. It has to be way out in the boonies. Well, one of the things they really wanted to do was they wanted to bring Michelle Forbes back and bring her as for those of you know where that's the woman who plays Rolaren. They're like, we want to bring her back. She's going to be perfect for this role, and it'll be another segue. Remember, at this point in time, what they were doing was actually kind of risky, although historically speaking, makes a lot of sense, although that's with the advantage of hindsight. Remember, TNG itself, as I will talk about, as I have talked about yesterday from your perspective, TNG was a hell of a risk, and was basically this brand new idea. Re revitalizing an IP and putting it back on broadcast, that was just not done. Now, uh, I guess this would have been about three years into TNG, roughly, when they really started working on the DS9 program. They were thinking, let's make another one. Let's make another Star Trek. Well, again, that just wasn't done. So they wanted to graft it to TNG so that fans would be more willing to accept it. Historically speaking, it's also interesting that one of the biggest reasons why DS9 was able to launch itself so well and enable itself to have that core fan base that stayed loyal for the majority of the series was because of the fact that TNG had established itself as its own thing, separate from the original series. These two were now considered separate aspects of Star Trek. And while there would always be people who would say, this isn't Star Trek because it doesn't have Kirk and it doesn't have Nimoy, there were now people who were fans of TNG. Not fans of Star Trek, but fans of TNG specifically. So they wanted to use that. And this is one of the biggest reasons why O'Brien and Stewart and, and Picard and Rolaren were going to be involved in Deep Space Nine. And they had all of this worked out, and they basically had most of the rough draft of the story already written and all the character concepts. And then Michelle Forbes says, no, I'm not doing that. I say that so casually. Obviously, she didn't want to be tied down by a long-term contract. And it's kind of easy to understand why. Even Avery Brooks himself, who I'll talk about a bit more later, was very hesitant to pick this up. So, then they were like, okay. And faced with the choice of radically altering the thing, or basically just casting Rolaren 2.0, they went with Rolaren 2.0, brought in Nana Visitor, and she ended up playing Kira Norris instead. That being said, while I have absolutely no you know, negative thoughts towards Michelle Forbes as an actress, I think Nana Visitor was actually the correct choice here. And of course, like DS9 was so good with, they took something that was thrown at them and made something of it, because Kira would then become her own character rather distinctly and dynamically. But I'm getting off topic. So... A lot of people have paralleled this episode to several other works of fiction. I mentioned the Babylon 5 stuff earlier. But it's interesting, as I was going back and reading some interviews, especially by Michael Piller, who pretty much wrote Emissary, how much inspiration was being deliberately taken from Encounter at Farpoint. Now, considering how recently I've gone through Encounter at Farpoint, uh, that would have been just last week from my perspective, and yesterday from your perspective, I have to admit that the parallels are actually quite strong, but not in a bad way. More like he looked at the structure of it, the skeleton of it, and said, let's do that. One of the things he mentions distinctly is, why don't we introduce characters, let them do stuff, then introduce new characters, and let them do stuff. This is something that Emissary would duplicate. This also probably has to do with the, 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 the visual presentation of the characters and their, their connections with each other I mentioned earlier. Similarly, there are undeniable qualities that connect the Q and the Prophets together. But what's weird about this, in a good way, is that the prophets really are alien, and they're presented wonderfully as alien. They are, in fact, far more alien than the Q are. The Q are stuffy aristocrats. I mean, they're actually not alien at all, really. Let's be honest with ourselves. Yeah, they have super advanced tech or amazing powers, whatever it is you ascribe to. But in terms of relatability, we could see people like the Q, minus their powers, in real life today. The prophets, by the other can chance, they come across as actually different. And I think that works a lot better, especially since it helps to do the same thing that the Q did to Picard to Cisco. I know that's a terribly constructed sentence, but what I mean by that is the, the best purpose behind the introduction of the Q was that they were an excellent way to showcase our characters. 
we didn't get a lot of insight into a lot of them. You know, Tasha, I, I pointed out perspective. But we got to learn a lot about how Picard worked thanks to his interaction with the Q more than we did to his interaction with anyone else. Remember, Picard was the man willing to humble himself and beg for help when he needed to. We got that thanks to his interaction with the Q. And over here in Emissary, we get so much of Cisco, the man, as thanks to his interaction with the prophets. But I am, of course, getting ahead of myself again. A couple other things I want to point out just super quick here. Three things, and then we'll get to the episode proper, finally. First of all, I was reading some of the old design documents, and the original intent was for Julian Bashir to be this really top-of-his-game, super amazingly awesome doctor, you know, top of his class, could ask... He even says this in the episode, I could have any assignment I wanted. I could have asked for it, and I would have gotten it, and I chose this one, because they wanted him to be someone who starts off tall, falls, and then rises back up in, as a new person from that. Okay, that makes a degree of sense. Um, then they wrote him as a complete jackass in order to accomplish this. Uh, and the sad part is, that original character concept, the ha ah, uh, uh, doesn't fit the actual backstory of Bashir that we find out over the course of the show at all. But I'll get more into that later. Next thing I want to talk about, two things that were left, I swear, is Gold Dukat. Now, I will be talking about Gold Dukat a lot over the course of this show, so I hope you guys don't mind me gushing about Gold Dukat for the next however many years it takes for us to go through this show, because it's going to happen. I'm just going to be honest with you. Mark Alemo is fantastic in the role, and the writer's team really stretched with him right up until Waltz, and I love his character. I'm sorry. I've talked before about the distinction between a character you hate and a character you just want to get off your screen, right? Like a character you hate, you're like, oh my god, I can't believe he did that, it's horrible, he's disgusting and horrible. But you don't want him off the camera. You want to see more of him, or her, or whatever, you know, it, doesn't matter, right? But a character you just want off the screen is the exact opposite. It's like all that horribleness, plus you're not enjoying it. And it's just, oh, no, I get off my screen, get off my camera, I don't want to see you anymore, right? Mark Alemo, my opinion, salvages Gold Dukat from the, from the latter into the former. I want you to do me a weird favor. If you have time, I always encourage people to watch these episodes with me and then watch my rumination, or watch my rumination and then watch the episode, whichever your preference is. But anyways, watch alongside these ruminations. And I've had literally hundreds of correspondents over the last several years across Voyager and Babylon 5 saying how awesome of an experience they've had doing that. So I, I recommend that to you as well. And one of the reasons is so that I can point to things like this. I want you to re-watch the episode. Uh, he shows up at 39 minutes and 14 seconds into the episode on the DVD, okay? Because that's, that's the copy I got. Because we're probably never getting the Blu-rays. Anyways, so I want you to re-watch, especially his initial scene where he comes into the office and we have his real introduction with Cisco. And I want you to close your eyes and divorce yourself from the actor's performance. Don't think about the Gul Dukat who is fleshed out over the next six years. Don't think about, you know, the, the actor's performance. Think about the lines on the page. Because he is written as a classic Type 3 villain, a slime ball, The kind of person who sneakily, connivingly worms his way around. You know what I mean, the smug snake type character. And he is written to be that kind of character. And the writers, over and over and over the next few years, will emphasize, no, he's a Nazi. He's the worst type of Nazi. He's supposed to be this horrible villain. But Mark Alemo never quite agreed with that. And to be completely blunt, I think the, for lack of a better term, creative differences between the writing staff and the producer and the actor, all three were involved in this tussle, crafted the immensely... <sighs> multi-dimensional character that Gold Dukat is. Now, I'm not saying he's a good person. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think anybody's arguing that Gold Dukat's a good person. But he is a very, very interesting character. And it helps that Mark Alemo is a very charismatic, theatrical actor, and it shows immediately. And that's why I say you have to divorce yourself. Because if, you're if you're watching the screen, he comes across with this... 
he, he's saying the lines, but it almost feels like he's parroting them. Like he's just saying whatever he's been told to do. And then every now and again he has a thing which just feels like something that's more natural, more him. Like that bit where he's like, forgive me, this was actually in my office a couple weeks ago. To be honest, I didn't actually want to leave. You know, that feels more like Ducat. And then he goes back to parroting, oh right, so you know, there's no wormhole and blah blah blah, you know, blah 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 blah, you know. Brilliant, brilliant performance. And whatever else, and we could argue Ducat till the end of time, and we probably will. I love. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and comments over the next you know, year or two as we go through the series. But I think we can all agree that he's a fantastic character, one way or the other. Which brings me to Cisco. Last thing we talk about before we actually get to the show uh, proper. And when when I say Cisco, what I actually mean is Avery Brooks. Now Avery Brooks is kind of an infamous example because he's sort of bypassed slash sidelined some of the legality when it comes to television production since then. If you ever wondered why he isn't really involved in things like Star Trek Online, it's because there's some legal issues with how the SAG works that kind of gets in the way of that. And I, I don't actually feel like going into details right now. All you need to know is that he was never really wanting to be a long-term television actor. And honestly, if not for several things it, all colliding to make him take this role, he probably wouldn't have. Like, when he was offered the role, he was like, yeah, right. And his car broke down. You know, this, is a, this story's been repeated by several people. And they're like, no, 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 we'll take the time. We'll wait. And apparently his wife was like, no, you, you need to take this job. And when he actually saw the script, they were like, he was really impressed with it. You know, Michael Piller apparently worked with him personally to try and, you know, pull the performance out of him. Allowed Avery Brooks to kind of have insight into the character that he wasn't writing. You know, stuff like that. In other words... The experience was strangely lucky for us to get Avery Brooks as Captain Sisko. And thank God for that. I'm sorry. Avery Brooks is Sisko. I mean, obviously I see that with hindsight, but you know what I mean, right? The man sells it. He is such a weird combination of deadly serious, affable, and manic. And it's such a weird combination that every time I see it, I'm just... And it's so, I love it, I love it, I love seeing it, I love his performance, I love his presentation. Even in the first episode, we start to see hints of the, the frankly Machiavellian kind of character that he is, and that he portrays. And how he'll come across as someone who will do his duty. And we see him angry, and we see him grieving, and we see him happy, and we see such a range of emotion. Avery Brooks is such an emotive actor. And I think... That's what really sells him. There's some, there's some scenes that some uh, viewers have argued about over the course of the whole series where they feel Avery Brooks was going over the top. But I don't agree in any one of those cases that's been put to my attention. I think that's just how he, how he acts. And to be front, I, I think that's just how Cisco is. He's the kind of person who, you know, he, he keeps himself reined in. But when those emotions burst, they burst. And I love it. Let's finally talk about the episode. So I mentioned the character thing about the way they're introduced. Listen to this, because this fascinated me. This is the order in which the characters are introduced, okay? Cisco, right at the beginning. Then Jake, okay? Then O'Brien, okay? Then Quark is actually the next one introduced. He doesn't have a lot of lines, but he is on camera and he does have several bits in the background. Then Kira. Okay, I'm with it so far. Then Nog. <laughs> now, yes, I do consider... Nog is probably technically a recurring character rather than a main character, but he is a significant, significant enough character I thought he qualified as a main character. It is so weird, isn't it, to think about this Nog, who, like... Barely had any lines. He was just like, come on, we gotta go. And he's just trying to rob some random ore samples from some random shop that would become Nog, right? I mean, isn't that just... A, I'm sorry. I know everyone else has already thought this, but it's just a weird thought every time I think of that. Anyways, so then Odo. Right after Nog, we get introduced to Odo. And then right after Odo, we get introduced to Dax and Bashir. Uh, I shouldn't say right after, but at the 32 minute and 24 second mark. Remember... The encounter at Farpoint Parallel. So 32 minutes and 24 seconds into the episode, Dax and Bashir get introduced pretty much within a second of each other. 
and then Bashir's an idiot, and then Dukat shows up about seven minutes later, and then Morn is the last character introduced. But that's such a weird way to introduce the main characters, isn't it? Wonder It works really well, but I digress. So the first thing we see is Vulcan Martok. Trivia question. How many of you knew that was the guy who plays Martok, who plays the Vulcan right at the very beginning, and during the Prophet Visions? I didn't. I'm not raising my hand. I didn't know that. Until I was going through this, I was like, wait, that's him? <laughs> so then we see Wolf 359. This is the most we've ever seen of Wolf 359 outside of you know, video games or you know, generally non-canon works. And it's exactly as horrifying and devastating as it should be. We get to see a lot more of the battle, and we get to see just how absolutely Starfleet is completely overwhelmed and cannot deal with this. They start the show with the action sequence, but they do it for character reasons, and they do it to establish. See, first of all, the first thing we find out is that Sisko's wife and son are on board his ship, the Saratoga, right? Why is that significant? Because this is a ship that is being tossed at the Borg. Now, the Starfleet at this point, this is during Best of Both Worlds. Starfleet is not ignorant of the Borg. When they first find out, when Admiral Hansen, I think, first says, you know, that we've got the Borg coming, he doesn't say it like, oh, we're going to go take them Borg out. No, he says it like, this is horrible, and I know it is, but we're going to do the best we can. This helps sell this scene so well for me, and sell the threat of the Borg so much, because the Federation and Starfleet was so unprepared for what the Borg really were. They knew it was a threat. They knew it was such a threat, and such a threat now, that they didn't have time to get the civilians off the ships. They had to send the ships now. The fleet is amassing, and by all accounts, based on the events of Best of Both Worlds and in this episode, that fleet barely got there on time. The whole reason they had to rush that fleet together and get it there is to try and intercept the cube. Otherwise, the cube would just keep going. I mean, why would it care about them, right? They had to literally get in its way. And then they do so. And then it crushes them. Whew. That's just, wow. So then the Saratoga is knocked out. Now, I've actually heard this question before. Now, I'm a Star Trek nitpicker, uh, arguably a professional Star Trek nitpicker, since I do get paid for this. But I've never had a problem with the fact that the Saratoga takes so long to be destroyed, that they have a chance, five minutes, give or take, to evacuate the ship. Do you know why? Because that's very Borg. All right. Tractor beam. Drain the shields. One shot there. Warp core destabilized. Moving on. The Borg are, above all other things, efficient. There was no need to keep firing or wasting energy or time or thought on destroying the Saratoga. Because it was destroyed. If they escape, so what? They're not a threat anymore. The threat has been neutralized, and there's no malice, there's no glory of the kill, there's no, you know, a desperate desire to survive that produces one to violent acts. They're the Borg. So they leave the Saratoga alone, and Cisco and crew have chance to, to try and get the hell out of Dodge. Which brings me to my next point. Cisco says, make sure to try and evacuate the civilians. Now, I mentioned that specifically. This is definitely me, re me reading too much into us. But given what we learn about Cisco across the course of the series, I do think this is the way Cisco was developed. Because I think Cisco, <laughs> similar to Sheridan, is a idealized military man. In other words, what I personally would consider to be the ideal of a military mindset. And the idea of get those civilians out, even if it means we don't get out, is implied in how he says that. My take on that. So then he gets his son out, and he watches his wife, who is already dead, as he is literally dragged away from her. I'll touch more on that moment later, when it comes up later. Obviously, though, what we see right at the beginning here is tragedy. <laughs> You remember when Rod Murray said that humans don't grieve anymore? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So he has to be literally physically carried away from his wife's corpse. And i got to be completely honest, and you're going to make fun of me, but that's okay. I actually cried a bit during this scene. Like, not bawling, but tears were forming 
when I was watching this scene. And what really struck me is the effortless, effortless casualness that the Borg did this. This wasn't some great battle to the Borg. This wasn't some great conquest or thing that they'd been working towards for years. The Saratoga, Cisco, Cisco's wife, were so far off the radar for the Borg that they would not think of them any more than you or I would think about a few particles of dirt we were stepping on on the road. They just casually destroyed Cisco's life. And now, now we have something that Deep Space Nine did that was brilliant. And in my opinion, is one of the things they did truly right. Something Voyager would later try to start and then fumble horribly. They established character arcs right at the get-go. Because now we have Sisko's character arc, the broken man and his son. Now, I'm not going to be talking a lot about Jake in this episode because, and as will be talked about in the future, Jake was never designed to be a character. He was designed to be a part of Sisko's character. Later on, that would change. But at the beginning, he was there to be a part of Sisko, not to be a character in his own right. So... I don't really have anything to say about him. That's why I kind of said, you know, the broken man and his son. That was part of the whole ideal. So, let's talk about the Bajoran occupation. In brief, we will be talking, we have so many more opportunities to talk about the Bajoran occupation. Now is not the time to do so. All I'm going to say right now is I bothered to look it up. It was 50 years, 50 years, the Bajorans were under occupation by the Cardassians. That's a long damn time. That's a long damn time. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that would have been what, 1967 or so? If my math is right. Imagine if in 1967, this is 2017 when I'm recording this, imagine if in 1967, the visitors from uh, V show up and occupy Earth. And then today, they are driven out. Is it? I mean, it's difficult to even process how much has changed in the last five decades. It's kind of insane when you really think about it. <laughs> so, 50 years. But one of the other things they do, and this is another thing that would become one of the hallmarks of Deep Space Nine, is they acknowledge politics. Now... TNG would occasionally dabble in politics. TOS would occasionally dabble in politics. But usually the political ramifications and realities were things that were happening either behind the scenes or have to be interpreted. It was one of the few DS9 was one of the few times where politics were dragged into the front and we actually got political stories. Now, when I say political stories, I don't mean some, guy, some boring guy in a news report reading the, the minutes from a board meeting. I mean the kind of stories that made Game of Thrones popular, the kind of stories that make Final Fantasy Tactics interesting, you know, political stories, stories of territory, stories of treaties, stories of wars. That's what I mean. As I like to distinguish a political story rather than a bureaucratic story. And so they acknowledge the politics right up front with regards to the Bajoran occupation, the Cardassian re removal, etc., etc. Um, as I have mentioned before and will mention again when we get there, a uh, chain of command was actually not intended to be the impetus for the Cardassian withdrawal. But in hindsight, it fits so perfectly that it has since become canonized. It is actually a part of canon now that the events of, of uh, chain of command and Jellicoe's actions and Picard's action, all that, that happened during those episodes, are, were the final tipping point. And I stress that that way because the number of factors that led to the Cardassian withdrawal are numerous. It's not like suddenly Klingons invaded, and so the Cardassians had to invade. It's not like the Borg showed up, so they had to withdraw. No, there were multiple different things, all sorts of different eff efforts from different sources that led to the eventual withdrawal of the Cardassian forces. And it was the civilian government that did so, not the military. And we already have the distinction established now between civilian and military when it comes to Cardassian leadership. Another thing that will pay off in the future, more political story arc stuff there. So, a uh, couple other just tiny notes. I like the fact that O'Brien actually has a smear on his outfit. <laughs> it's just a nice touch. It shows that he's been more or less literally elbow deep in, in, the, in the grease 
trying to fix this damn station since he got here. Very O'Brien thing to do. Show up, get to work. Uh, we also see Cisco's Machiavellian sense. I already mentioned that before, but there's two things he does very well right at the beginning. First of all, he work he identifies Kira's standoffishness very quickly. Now, a let's be blunt, normal Starfleet officer would probably try to overwhelm her with kindness. You know what I mean, right? Cisco correctly identifies that that's the wrong approach here and says, "Well, hang on, hang on." Okay, you're standoffish and you don't like me. That's tough. And that's pretty much how he approaches it. He is not rude to her. He is not mean to her. He does not give her any additional kindling for that fire. And he matches her point for point. Again, literally going and physically picking up the debris to carry it off as commander of the station. But he also does not try to barrage her with flowers, if you will. And I think that approach is part of what earns his resp earns in her her respect of him. I, I, that's, my fr my sentences are terrible today. Forgive me. I'm so excited about this show. I love this show. God, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, so he works with her on that, and then the way he manipulates Quark is frankly fantastic. He approaches Quark, and note how he does it. He goes to Quark and says you could make some money here. And Quark says, <laughs> And so Cisco approaches it the second way and says, basically, rather than appealing to Quark's greed, which is the most obvious approach, he then he just, he tries to convince him as he would another sentient, regardless of all of the qualifiers. He says, quite correctly, we need an establishing point. We need bedrock to build on. Right now, all we got is a lot of sand. We need something a little more concrete. Now, I'm s summarizing, but that is what he means. And it's interesting to note that DS9 quite correctly shows that this is not just the correct answer. It is the only gamble Cisco can make, but it was not guaranteed to succeed. But, and again, this is a political thing, people are more likely to do a thing if they see someone else successfully doing a thing, right? It becomes more acceptable. It becomes less risky. It becomes more normal. So one person, Quark, and his bar, staying behind, rising up the establishment, running the Davo tables, meant now we have some bedrock. And it worked brilliantly, really. But it is still worth noting that that was a gamble. It was not guaranteed to work. But that doesn't work either. He, he doesn't successfully convince Quark with that one. Then he goes for the blackmail. So, you remember your nephew? Now, this is, again, how Cisco operates, and, again, helps to distinguish his character, because he correctly identifies that, to put this bluntly, despite being a Ferengi, Quark cares about Nog. And he does. I mean, obviously, we know that now, from the perspective of seven years of, T of DS9. But even in the first episode, it is clearly established that Quark cares about Nog. Cisco identifies that, and uses that against him. I think all of these qualities are really why Cisco was assigned to this station. I think someone at Starfleet looked at Cisco and said, you're good at this kind of thing. We don't need a Picard out there. Picard's the diplomat and, and the tactical, you know, not tactical, excuse me, the strategic commander. He's not someone we need involved in this. And we don't need someone like Kirk. We need someone who's willing to twist the gears. I know I'm mixing metaphors there, but it works if you think about it. We need someone who is willing to look at what needs to happen to make the machine work and is willing to twist those gears into position if he has to. And that's exactly what Cisco does. And he's smart enough and bright enough to pick up on that immediately. So, then we see Patrick Stewart. Now, this is Patrick Stewart circa season six. So uh, he's a little more warm and friendly than the Patrick Stewart that we just saw yesterday with Encounter at Farpoint. It's going to be interesting comparing these back and forth a bit. But we see him there. And what's really interesting to me is he comes across as very warm, very affable, and very friendly. Commander! Oh, yes! How's it going? How are things? And then Cisco says, yeah, we met at Wolf 359. Picard's demeanor instantly changes. And he is cold and terse the entire rest of the meeting. To the point where, it, it's, I mean, Patrick Stewart can deliver that kind of, 
I'm disappointed in you glare. Like that cold, just, oh, God. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? He can do that perfectly. I, that's the kind of thing that would probably wilt a lesser man. But, of course, he's talking to Cisco. <laughs> it's just, wow, holy God. And the, and the meeting gets colder and colder and more tense as Cisco gets visibly more angry the longer the meeting goes on. Now, this scene is brilliant for three reasons. Number one, it helps to bridge the gap between TNG and DS9. Connecting the two helping to establish the canon, and giving the fans a reason to give a damn about Deep Space Nine, because one of their favorite characters is on the show. I already talked about that, the stapling thing, right? Second reason, because it's a great character moment for Picard. Yeah, that's right. Now, I've actually already talked about all this stuff, because I've talked about First Contact, and that's really where this comes to a head. But in First Contact, I mentioned, forgive me for repeating myself, how... This man, who is one of the heroes of the Federation, one of the giants of Starfleet, one of the people that everyone knows, who has his own holiday, who can literally be honored and venerated as one of the greatest captains who ever lived in the history of history. And his mark, his record, is stained by that one time they got him. And we see how the Borg once again, fulfill Picard's character and, and add to it and, and blemish it with their existence. This man, unwilling to look past the realities of that because of that one time. And the third reason this is brilliant is because it helps to establish Sisko's relationship with Kira. No, really, hear me out. See, this is the great dynamic here, because Cisco is established, partially because of, almost universally actually, because of this scene as someone who does not want this assignment, who does not want to do this, who does not want to be here. He's got a son, he's thinking about, he, the way he says, I'm thinking about taking civilian life, it sounds like the kind of thing that you say when you're angry. You know what I mean, right? The kind of thing you don't actually mean, the kind of thing that you don't want to say, but it just, you blurt it out because you're angry. You could literally replace the words with, I'm angry, and the same information would be conveyed, right? But it's made clear he doesn't want this, but because he has a strong sense of responsibility, he is still willing to perform his duty to the best of his abilities. And that's Kira as she's established in this episode, too. She hates all this. She is a ball of anger, almost the entire episode. Anger at Starfleet, because she doesn't trust them. And, it's, it's stated later, but it's still implied in the first episode, where the hell were you guys when we needed you for the last five decades? Right? How many people in the Federation sat back and did this? For 50 years, and didn't intervene directly, because of the Prime Directive. You know? I mean, I'm not trying to bring up a prime directive argument. I'm trying to say, put yourself in her shoes. Wouldn't you be pissed? Screw the Federation. Now you're showing up? We don't need you. And the provisional government, oh, don't even get me started on them. They have no idea what they're doing. And of course they don't. They haven't run their own government in 50 years. I'm sorry to keep hammering that point in, but you get it? But, and, and, as she herself says, Cisco flat out hits her. You know, what do you think is going to happen when this falls apart? And she says, civil war. And the way Nana Visitor delivers that line, I like her as an actress, but like Terry Farrell, it's clear she wasn't really strong of an actress early on. Like, she was still getting her footing. And I feel like this show helped shore that up in several ways. But that line is delivered perfectly. Because it's said with this, this the tone... Of you know, like like you should be saying this, ha <laughs> It'll be civil war. But instead, it's just grim, unfortunate realization. It reminds me of the way Jakar over on Babylon Five would give a war declaration. You remember the scene I'm talking about? If you happen to have watched Babylon Five, you know that sort of. This is something I thought I wanted, but I don't at all, and this is terrible. Now I'm not saying Kira wanted civil war. What I am saying is that Kira wanted, you know, Bajoran for Bajorans. You know, we, we stick to ourselves and screw all this other crap. But she also admits that doing that would lead to civil war. And she's right. It would be a mess. It's the same damn thing that would happen on Earth if those visitors from V were kicked out this year. We would have civil war. 
Who would have civil wars, for God's sakes? And this, of course, is a perfect segue. So we've established her character, we've established his character, and their dynamic, and then that segues beautifully into the prophets and the Bajoran religion. And for the first time, well, I shouldn't say that, that's a lie, but for one of the few times in Star Trek, religion is actually treated pretty well. Now, Roddenberry himself was an, an ad, ad, uh, wrong word, uh, a loud atheist, right? Like, he, he would just be like, ah, no God, no God, you know, that kind of a thing, right? And whatever. But that, had, that has and had colored several episodes of both TOS and TNG. And I feel that several times uh, Star Trek has treated religion as if it's this universally negative evil thing. Now, <laughs> I don't mean to dip my toes into things that I don't like to talk about on my show or in real life, but I think that's far too simplistic of a mindset. To say that religion, as a concept, or all religions, universally, are all evil, horrible institutions, just doesn't quite sit well with me. And what we see here is that the Bajoran belief in the prophets has basically been the one thing that has unified them as a people throughout all of this. And of course it has. Again, 50 years of occupation. What else do you have? You've got your cultural identity as Bajorans, Got to admit, most individual uh, racial groups of Bajorans probably kind of stopped existing during the occupation. They probably had people who were, to use real-life equivalents, you know, Europeans or Americans or South Americans or Australians. And we all have our own racial diversity, right? Well, all of that probably got <clears throat> after 50 years of, of doom. So now we just have Bajorans. And honestly, I think we'd probably have a similar thing here with just humans. So that's the one thing they got, and the other thing they had was their belief in the prophets. Now, it helps that the prophets are actually beings that are right there that have actually been sending out these orbs to them over the last 10,000 years. Ahem, sorry, 10,000 years. <laughs> but this kind of makes my point for me. This is something that Cisco immediately approaches with that same responsibility and that same Machiavellian intent. Everything he does as he's going, he's going along with seeing uh, Kai Opaka, and he goes down there and he tolerates her, and you can tell he's just tolerating her. He's like, oh, whatever. And the whole time he's doing it because this is a gear that he can twist. He could use the Bajoran religion in order to try and help stabilize the Bajoran people. It's what you get when you get someone who's Machiavellian with a good intention and good and, and a, a, a strong sense of morality rather than, you know, what you usually think of when you think of the term Machiavellian, right? So he's looking at this like, ah, oh, this is a wonderful tool I can use. And then he actually has his first vision. Now, I got to take an aside really quick here. The episode actually says it's the orb of prophecy and change. Uh, however, it's probably more likely that it's the orb of memory. I mention this because the orb of prophecy and change functions differently as we see it later in future episodes. And in this case, both with the interactions with him and the interactions with Dax later, it just shows them a flashback which they can't really alter or interact with other than just to have the flashback. I mean, yes, he alters history because of the flashback, but nothing changes of it. He's not literally changing the past, not like what would happen uh, in the future with, with Kira's experience with that, for example. So make of that what you will. But uh, I just thought I'd point it out because I am a geek, and I'm not particularly ashamed of that. What I find interesting is the moment it brings both of them, though, from a writer's perspective. For him, it was one of the two critical points of his life. And for her, it was the critical point of her life. And I think this was done de deliberately by Michael Piller. I think this was a thematic Chekhov's gun. Because later on, Sisko will have to use events like this to explain linear concepts to the prophets. And in so doing, we get to see... I mean, it, obviously, we are linear beings. We understand how that works, right? But sometimes something is so normal, it has to be explained. You know what I mean? Like, how often do you sit back and think about doing things like this, right? Like, you don't. You just do it. But when you're going to introduce something like that in a work of fiction, where you're going to have to explain to someone how this works, well, you've got to stop and explain it for yourself first. 
And so they show this interaction with Cisco and Jennifer, and they show the interaction with Dax and, well, excuse me, Jadzia and... Oh my god, I can't think of his name. Old Dax. I can't think of his name. Oh my god. Anyways, you know, they show those interactions to help lay the groundwork for what would later happen. I've been talking without my notes for this whole time. That's how good DS9 is. I can just do this off the top of my head. But let me check my notes. Let me make sure I haven't missed anything here. Uh, I already talked about the trill. So so then, yeah, so uh, Bashir, right? Okay. I want to talk about two things with regards to Bashir really quick, okay? First of all, Bashir made me want to smack him in pretty much all of season one, to be blunt. Just, oh my god, what are you doing? And I don't think I'm alone in that. <laughs> and again, as I mentioned, he was deliberately written to be a jackass. But what I find interesting is that most of this still makes sense if you take the whole of canon into account. Obviously, back then, he was going to be this cocky person who was brought low and blah, blah, blah. I already said that, right? But think about the genetic Superman. Why would the genetic Superman, who deliberately screwed up on that test in order to make sure he wasn't the top, who bowed out of a career at the sports, you know, in, 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 in uh, tennis or whatever it was, specifically so that he would avoid the, the attention and the possibility of being found out that that would bring. Imagine looking at that character. Now tell me, why would that Bashir choose Deep Space Nine? And you know the answer. It makes so much sense. It's actually... It, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. The more I think about Bashir's superhuman genetic inf influence, the more his character makes sense. He has gone to Deep Space Nine to get out of the microscope. He wants to practice medicine. He is a doctor. He has the same trait that basically every Starfleet doctor has, and most fictional actors do. Help people, and then everything else. You know, there's other character traits there, but the help people is right at the top. The Doctor has that, Crusher has that, McCoy has that, and, well, Phlox is more debatable. But the point being, you know, they've got that thing going for them, right? Right? So he wants to practice medicine. He wants to help people. By God, I'm going to go over there where you're not going to look at me too carefully. And how best to make sure that no one gets close enough to him to really pry into his personal life to find out more about the truth of him. To be as standoffish as possible. And to present yourself as a clumsy arrogant, like a clumsy form of arrogant. The way he talks to Kira, I can't wait to be out here on the on the frontier and doing all this stuff. And then, you know, it's out here in the, in the wilderness. That's such an obvious move. It's so obvious that at the time, and it's clear, of course, this was part of the, the original character arc, it was just to emphasize how the man has, for lack of a better term, no wisdom score. You know, just shoves his foot into his mouth. But with the perspective of hindsight, and again, don't, don't mistake me for saying this is the writer's intent. We know the writers did not intend this. The genetic engineering thing was made up pretty much on the fly later on. But it's amazing how well it fits, because then he did it on purpose. Deliberately ostracizing people, deliberately pushing people away, so that they wouldn't actually get too close to him, and he could just do what he really wanted to do, and live in his corner, and try to at least do something with his life. Again, bringing up that bit later with the in the episode with the tennis and all that, the alien, I can't think of his name, also mentions he could have had uh, Dax, J Jadzia, easily and multiple times if he actually wanted to truly pursue her. Instead, he clumsily, forcefully pursues her in a way that will push her away. Nice shield there. Huh? Anyways, so then we see Terry Farrell... Uh, as I mentioned before, she struggles a little bit early on, especially with the amount of techno babble she has to read. You know, no surprise there. And again, I, I, I owe no ill will to the actress for that. In fact, if anything, uh, I think having done some research on Deep Space Nine, I have a lot more respect for her than I originally did. But I do have to admit, it must have really sucked for Terry Farrell. She showed up on day eleven of footage. Now, if you don't, a uh, principal shooting, more specifically. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means that other people had had eleven days of being on the camera and however many more days of being there, reading the script, talking to each other, talking to the writers, talking to the directors, before they actually went on camera. Terry Farrell shows up on day 11. 
Nobody knows who she is, and she doesn't know who anybody is. I mean, that, that had to have sucked. And she herself has gone on record as saying that it, it sucked. It was an unpleasant experience, and she felt like the, the odd man out, so to speak. <laughs> I think she did a good job with what she had available, though. Um, but I have to admit, there wasn't a lot of chemistry there. And this is a good time to mention that, by the way. I've praised the chemistry thing before when it comes to actors and the way they interact with each other. And I, I know I keep going back to it, but Caretaker, Voyager, oozed chemistry. Really was the best part of that episode, the way the characters just clicked with each other so perfectly. TNG, hit or miss, but even in Encounter at Farpoint, several of the actors did have very nice flowing chemistry with each other. Here in Emissary, not a lot of chemistry on display. There's a lot of good writing, there's a lot of good character moments, but most of those character moments are either in an absence or moments that are framed to fit the character rather than to framed to fit the characters, if that makes sense. So not a lot of real natural chemistry between most of the actors in this first episode. We'll see at what point that develops, because I know for a fact that at some point in Deep Space Nine these actors start gelling together perfectly. But I'm very curious when that started to be a thing, because it wasn't natural, it had to be learned. Anyways, so, then we get a really amazing scene with Picard. Now, I've already talked about this before. He does the send-off to O'Brien, kind of like McCoy did the send-off to Data back in Encounter at Farpoint. And what I love most about it is that it is fantastically human. There's no big send-off, there's no big speech. I'm proud to say... No, it's just two guys saying, hey... You'll be missed. You know, Brian's like, yeah, well, you know, it's just a transporter room. And the way he says that, God, I'm sorry, I love Khomeini. The way he says that, you know, obviously it meant something to him. And you know what? I bet you money that this Picard, season six Picard, is the kind of captain who knew every transporter chief and exactly which room was theirs. Transporter room three was O'Brien's room, and he knew that. And you can tell. Wonderfully human. Great send-off. Uh, so, we move forward. We, I have a lot less notes for the latter ha half, really, uh, of the episode. It's from 47 minutes and onwards, really, at this point. I do want to talk about a couple of things. So, first of all, I've got a note here really quick, and I just want to say, Mark Alemo is awesome. I know I already said it, I'm just rehashing it, but this is where all my notes about him were. Um... Also, really nice uh, touch with using Odo. Um, one of the best things to do in a show is to establish the characters' uh, tool sets so that the audience and the writers can now know what they can do and then play with that later. So we see, you know, obviously O'Brien's the engineer and he employs a little bit of percussive maintenance, which was awesome to get Odo back. Odo the shapeshifter. Notice they don't actually say, I'm a shapeshifter, exposition, exposition. I'll talk about it in a second. Instead, they have the mace flowing through him earlier, which worked great. And then the way he infiltrated the Cardassian ship, which worked great. All of that was very natural, very perfect. We don't need to be handheld there. It does fail a little bit, because the next thing that happens is that Odo then has to... Well, I shouldn't say the next thing, it's actually a bit down. But, you know, then Odo has to basically dump his exposition on Kira. Which is probably the only bit of exposition in the whole, epi in the whole episode that feels forced. And I hate to comment on that, but it is kind of a uh, scene, especially since he's saying this to Kira, someone who's known him for years at this point. So, yeah. Nevertheless, they had to shove it in there somehow, whatever. Uh, anyways, so at 47 minutes, 47 minutes, the wormhole shows up. But before I talk about the wormhole, I want to talk about the station. Now, first of all, making this a non-Federation station was pretty much mandatory. They almost had to, uh, especially when the construction of Bajor being the location came into it. You have to do a non-Federation station, or you have to set this further along in the timeline than you originally intended to. And they wanted this to be timeline-wise along TNG, just like it was in real life, unless you lived in Britain. So they had to have some kind of station already. Well, obviously, it's a Cardassian station. And they use that. And the set directors and the set designers were all given the direction, make this place look non-Federation. And I think they did a great job, personally. And so it establishes its own aesthetic, which helps to visually distinguish it from TNG, 
thus helping the show to form its own identity so that viewers don't think, oh, it's TNG 2.0, which it's not. You see how that's brilliant in its own quiet little way? I mean, it's kind of obvious too, but it's still quietly smart the way they do that. But then they have a problem, and this is an interesting problem from a writer's perspective. I look forward to talking about this over the next several episodes because DS9 is basically defenseless, and that's a problem. I'm going to talk about some politics here real quick. Forgive me. So let's say the Cardassians show up with a fleet of gulls. Or gulls, wow, I can't believe I said that. Galors. You know, even just a squadron. Eight Galors show up. All right. One Galor could decimate Deep Space Nine. So only 10% of it's still floating in space. And then they could get rid of that, too, if they really felt like it. You know, Deep Space Nine is defenseless. How do you deal with that as a writer, right? Well... There's a couple of ways you can deal with that. And the way they deal with it in the episode is twofold. One, call for help. Oh, well, there goes the help. Two, you can apply things politically. Remember, they don't defeat the Cardassian fleet that's attacking them with force of arms. They defeat them politically. Cisco negotiates the exit from the... They, we don't see this on camera. We don't need to. He negotiates, you know, the passage to the wormhole, and, this is the important part, manages to save Gul Dukat's personal Galor and get his ship out of there. He gives the... He, he basically goes to bat for them and says, okay, we've got this for you now. What are you going to do? And then Gul Dukat calls off his people, and now the military have a lot less of a, for lack of a better term, Cassus Belli in order to go after Deep Space Nine. Now they could, of course, they have the force to do so, but they have a lot less justification. And as real life has shown many, many times, just because you have the force of arms doesn't mean you have the justification. You need to have some reason or some way to get around that or some way to bypass that. And they have just lost some of theirs. And it's a brilliant approach to that. And I, and I want to say that from a writing perspective, writing for a station or a ship or something that is effectively defenseless would be a great creative challenge. I would love to write for something like that some days. I, I would have loved to be on the writing staff for Deep Space Nine. Do you know how much I would have... Sorry. <laughs> um, so the wormhole. 70, 47 minutes into the episode. Wormhole shows up. <laughs> Let me just say the wormhole was a brilliant, brilliant decision by, by the creators of this show. Now, they would sort of misuse this in future episodes, and I will talk about this as we get to it. But all I'm going to say right now is it was brilliant because it was a stable wormhole. Now, any, any Trek fan will say a stable wormhole is a damn rare occurrence. It's the kind of thing that just doesn't happen, right? I mean, we even had an entire episode about that. Um, oh, I don't remember the name of it. It was like The Gift or something. No, it wasn't The Gift. That's, that's Voyager. It was the episode with... Troy and the other Betazoid and the Ferengi and, and the bartering. You know the one I'm talking about, right? They had a whole episode, whoops, whoops, of TNG dedicated... We're still recording, right? Hang on. Yeah, we're still recording. Oh my gosh, okay. A whole episode of TNG dedicated towards talking about wormholes and the fact that a stable wormhole is exceptionally rare and unusual, right? Whole episode about that. And it's been mentioned several times since. So having a stable wormhole anywhere is suddenly a big deal. And I like that. Because what if the wormhole wasn't there? What does this become? Okay, so it's a frontier station on Bajor, and there's some political stuff with the Cardassians, and there's some political stuff with the Bajorans, and that's kind of it. No, seriously, that is kind of it. There's certainly some stories you can do with that, and I will not deny that at all. But... I would also say that you cannot deny that the creative possibilities a stable wormhole adds to the situation are monumental. Kira herself even mentions this in character. We need to stake a claim on that wormhole. This could put Bajor on the map. In fact, I believe Picard says that to Cisco later. Now we have something of unmeasured importance. And from a writing perspective, we have an outlet to be able to bring stories to us. And, of course, this will show why so many of these large, multi-quadrant affecting events will happen around this one dinky station. Now, the argument could be leveled that you could just have a much more down-to-earth storytelling. And you could. I'm not going to argue that. That's, that's totally valid. 
But now, with the wormhole there, you have the option of doing much larger scale storytelling. Things like Klingons, and Romulans, and the Dominion, and so forth and so on. So, brilliant choice, brilliant choice. Next thing I want to talk about, though, do you think it's a wormhole at all? Honest question. I mean, obviously it's a point in space that leads to another point in space, but do you think it's a wormhole? Now, part of the reason I ask this is, aside from its stability and the fact that it's a connecting point between two places in space, it doesn't actually act like a wormhole at all, or function like one at all. And that's interesting to me. And I think, this is just my opinion, and again, we'll talk a lot more about the prophets later, not today, but I think that the, the Bajoran wormhole as we all call it, and as I will call it as well, is one of two things. Either it's an artificial wormhole they crafted because of their nonlinear nature, basically knowing that it would be useful in the future, if you follow that, or that's just where they live. That's just how they exist. And it also, by coincidence, happens to serve this same function. Make of that what you will. I've heard a theory once, I forget where or whom, uh, but someone said that there that maybe this was a normal wormhole, you know, the kind of warping around one, and the prophets just kind of roamed into it, inhabited it, and were like, oh, okay. And because the prophets are there, that provided the stabilizing element. Food for thought. One thing I find amusing is that nobody has ever discovered this wormhole before now. The funny thing is, though, unlike most shows, I don't think that's a case of bad writing. Because the Cardassians wouldn't have any interest in doing that. And nobody was really caring about finding this place. So it was just like, eh, okay, whatever. <laughs> it wasn't until that Sisko was personally asked by the leader of the Bajoran religion to do this as part of his attempt to unite the Bajoran people as part of his directive as a Federation officer that, that this came into the play, right? So I, I can't, I'm, I'm, with, I'm willing to go with them on that, that nobody had found it till now, aside from a few people who weren't really able to, shall we say, do anything about it. Where's my notes? I've lost my notes. Okay, so... Do you think that the, worm, that the place they bring them to, the wormhole space or whatever, is a morphic realm? Or do you think it's deliberately representative? Because, you know, we, she sees, ah, and he sees, Rah. And obviously, visually and audibly, we get the point immediately. Her mind is free and open and clear. His is dark and gloomy. Duh. Boom. We get that. But why do you think it is? I personally think it's actually neither. I don't think it's a morphic realm, and I don't think it's their attempt to be representative. I think it's indicative of how the prophets communicate people with people by directly connecting not to the person, but to their minds. And so when they connect to their minds, what is seen is a reflection of themselves. Because remember, they had to learn how to even communicate. Oh, and by the way, I can't wait to gush about that. Oh my god. Anyway, sorry, 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 sorry. So they had to learn how to even communicate, right? So this is their first attempt, basically. Hang on. What do we see there? And so what uh, Jadzia sees, I keep wanting to call her Dax, what Jadzia sees and what Sisko sees is more or less literally a mirror of what's in their head as the prophets are trying to communicate with them. Now looking back with hindsight, we know exactly why the prophets chose to, to, to keep Sisko there and to keep talking with him. I mean, you know, right? <laughs> we all know this, right? But... Why did he do so at the time? Why did they pick him at the time? Why him and not Judzia? Honest question. I'm just leaving this question open there. What do you guys think? You know, without the advantage of hindsight, without knowing the rest of the series or the development of his character, why do you think they picked him? Now, it is worth noting that since he is the emissary of the t episode's title, it's entirely possible that thanks to their nonlinear nature, even if we ignore the developments of the character that would happen in the future that we don't know about yet, they would still know that he is supposed to be the emissary to them because nonlinear time. It's funny how you can get around of a lot of things with that whole nonlinear part. So, it's entirely feasible that they went after him because they already did in the future, if you follow that. So, I'm going to skip ahead of my notes a little bit here. So I mentioned the exposition from Odo to Kira. I already talked about that. 
And I want to say something about O'Brien really quick, because O'Brien has a good scene for him. And it's it's a great scene. It's the scene where he's trying to, to get the bubble to move the station, which is already kind of insane. But he manages it, right? He moves the station away from Bajor towards the Bajoran wormhole. What I love about that scene is that it helps to emphasize something I've always liked about O'Brien. And I'm going to be gush- gushing about O'Brien a lot through this series, just to warn you. I think I already said that. <laughs> I don't know, I've been talking for a bit. No, my throat's already starting to hurt and everything. But I meant I mentioned this because O'Brien is not stupid. He's actually quite brilliant. He's very good at no, transporters, obviously, but engineering in general. And he is really good at jury-rigging things. And he's simple. He's not dumb. He's not really ordinary. He's just wonderfully down to earth. And that gets across in this scene. You know, he's li- literally him ranting at the computer. Saying, computer, we need to have a talk about this. No, I'll just do it manually. Screw it. That is so wonderfully him. And it hits this nice little slice of his personality that I, I find fantastic. Anyways, uh, so skipping ahead, skipping ahead. Um, here's an interesting question for you. Uh, we already know, as of this point, from TNG, that O'Brien has a past with the Cardassians. He was involved in the Cardassian War, after all. The border skirmishes, right? And we know this. There was a whole episode about it and everything. So, that's already established, but I like how he neatly slides in a bit of well-written exposition. Where Bashir is like, well, I mean, you know, they can't do anything to us, right? And O'Brien says, you ever heard of the massacre of such and such? Yeah. And Kira says, what do you think we should do? And he says, well, you know how they treat their prisoners. Because he does too. And it's it's almost slid under the rug how natural it is. But from that little tidbit, even if you didn't know O'Brien from TNG, you can get immediately, this is a man who knows his enemy, who has experience with them. And that'll be relevant in the future too. So props to them on that. Here's an interesting question for you. What do, you, what do you think would have happened if things hadn't turned out the way they did? If, if the Cardassians had pressed the offensive, right? I mean, what would they have done with the Federation prisoners? I mean, think about that for a second. Because there's all sorts of political mess they could have had there. They could have even had, oh yeah, we're just going to keep these prisoners uh, to return to you at a certain time. What are you going to do with the Bajoran prisoners? Well, that's not really your concern. They're not a Federation citizen, you know. Or they could have just killed them and said, screw it. Although it's interesting to note that this helps to establish very, very early on that the series bad guys are going to start off being the Cardassians. You know, how like the Ferengi were supposed to be over in TNG. If you remember, the Ferengi were actually name-dropped in uh, Encounter at Farpoint. So, and then there's there's some good action. I don't have anything else to really comment on it. There's just some good action scenes. Uh, Odo, uh, Brené Abergenois, Helps with the doctor. That that was a nice touch. That made me smile. I'd actually seen that movie before this came out, so that helped. And uh, and then towards the end, you know, Picard and Cisco's shared scene right at the end, where Picard starts off cold. Remember how the conversation ended last time? But Cisco is the one who starts off warm and is like, "No, no, no, it's it's okay, it's okay. I got this." And then Picard's like, "Okay, then. I will trust you as a Starfleet officer. You know, professional respect there." But I've kind of cut ahead because I'm going around what is, in my opinion, the best part of the episode. I liked Emissary right up until Cisco starts contact with the Prophets, and then I loved it. Call me an outlier, if you wish. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't really talk about this scene all that often, so I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this. But I thought the Prophet scenes were phenomenal. The, 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 way, the way they decide to use images to try and provoke stimuli, to try and invoke emotions, to determine method of communication, to then attempt to communicate. It's such a natural progression, the way the prophets reach out to Cisco, And then the way Cisco interacts with them is probably one of the most brilliant first contact situations I've ever seen, possibly outside of the episode first contact, not the movie first contact, the episode first contact itself. Because the way they interact with it and the way Cisco approaches it, I mean, he approaches it like someone who's, and I'm just going to say this as bluntly as possible, like he's a frickin' Starfleet officer. Like he's actually competent at his job. And it's weird that I have to say that like it's strange, but let's be blunt, for the most part, 
Starfleet officers are not really portrayed as all that competent in Star Trek. I mean, there's kind of a bad history there, right? So it was nice to see Cisco approaching this and being like, yes, this is me. I am human. What are you? You know, and just, just trying to establish this dialogue and work together with them. And there's, it's just chock full of amazing. It really is. I'm looking at my notes to see if there's any specific things I wanted to toss out here. But there's really some awesome stuff there. Because what it does is in addition to establishing the profits, which will be an important part of the show, it helps establish Cisco. I already told you this, but again, just like how the Q gave us Picard, the profits give us Cisco. We've seen how Cisco operates. We've seen how Cisco interact directs with other people. This is Cisco with all those masks teared down. This is basically the closest thing to the real Cisco, the the person underneath all of that, underneath the responsibility. Underneath the duty, underneath the, the the uniform, underneath the masks he wears, and he just bears himself out. And it, it ha it's funny because this is it's so obvious. And every Brooks nails this, by the way. It's so obvious how painful it is for him to go through all of this as he's trying to explain things to people who don't understand what pain means. And there's this brilliant bit where it's like she is part of your existence, and he keeps emphasizing, no, she was part of my existence, not now. She is no longer part of my existence because he is trying to explain linear concepts, loss and death to them, but they are trying to explain that she is still a part of him now. It is not linear, as she ends up ending saying to them. And it's a brilliant way of doing that. And then he keeps saying, you know, I, I don't want to be here. Then why do you exist here? It's such an obvious thing in hindsight. And he's just like, I don't understand this. Why don't you? No, no, you exist here. This is you. And he and and oh my God! Before I keep going, I mean, there's that bit with the baseball. I have to comment on that really quick. I almost forgot about it. It's in my notes here. The baseball as a way to explain linear time is fantastic. You know, he's like, okay, you need to shoot it between the lines and da da da. And... Okay, hang on. Never mind. Never mind. You don't care about the rules. It's a nice little bit. But the usage of baseball as a way to explain linear development and concepts was actually kind of a stroke of genius in its own right. I don't know what's going to happen when I toss this ball, but what does happen is going to shape what happens next, which is going to shape what happens next, and next, and next. And, the, and he explains this to them. He explains this to the two prophets he's speaking to. Quick aside, I think the choice to never have a visual form for the prophets was the right one. And the, the method of using existing actors as the thing was brilliant for two reasons. Number one, it adds to the wonderfully alien nature of the prophets, that they literally do not have any form. Again, to parallel them, unlike the Q, who have John Delancey and however many other Q show up over the years, there is no visual form to the prophets. There never was and there never will be. Not Unless we're counting Sisko's mother, which I'm not, for the reference. So, right? But the second reason is because, from an out-of-character perspective, it allows the actors to be more involved in the episode. Frankly, the guy who played Jake probably had more lines as a prophet than he did as Jake Sisko in this episode. And that's a good thing, in my opinion. It helps the actors to grow. It gives them more to do. It keeps them more involved. It makes this more some a creative work they're working on if they are more involved in more aspects of production than just a job they're going to, right? At least, that's what I think. So then, you know, why do you exist? You're getting back to what I was talking about earlier. He flat out says, I never left this ship. Every time I close my eyes, I see her here. And how could he, honestly? How do you deal with something like that? How do you adapt to something like that? What do you do when something so beyond your capacity to comprehend happens to you and you are left a broken man or a broken woman or whatever? How do you deal with that? Everyone deals with it in different ways, but the way Cisco dealt with it was that he locked it away. He just said, nope. And it's such a wonderfully human moment to watch this man sob. And there's no... There's no tact here. This isn't a stratagem. He's not trying to defeat a superior life form. 
He is sobbing because he has never come to grips with the death of his wife. And he is being forced to see it as a result of his encounter with these aliens. And that really helps to establish Benjamin Sisko to me. Because Kirk is a heroic figure. And Picard is a statue among men. And I mean both of these things in good ways, by the way. But Sisko, Sisko is a human. Sisko is the man who sobs, who bleeds, who cries. He is far more down to earth than any of those other examples. And it helps to give that contrast, and again, to help establish the show's own tone, separate from TNG and, of course, separate from TOS. And I thought that's awesome. I don't have much else to share, or indeed anything to share. I'm out of notes, finally. Sorry for rambling on for so long. I have absolutely adored going through this episode again. It's a shame the rest of season one is going to be a lot less good by memory. I suppose we'll see if my opinion, uh, after going through with analysis mode, agrees with my memory. But for now, I will be seeing you guys next time.